very private people, which, which which kind of brings me to the question, why now for you? You guys have always been so private. Why now are you willing to tell your story and share so much of your life with people? I think timing is everything, honestly. Like, I, everyone knew that the last dance was going to be incredible. Like, there was no denying. Obviously, when you get to see behind, in my opinion, one of the greatest teams that has ever been formed, and you get to see behind the scenes, behind the curtain, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's no denying it was going to be an incredible project. Um, mm -hmm. so for me, I knew that media is going to reach out and, and, you know, that people are going to want inside takes and stories. And it was just one of those things that I had to determine, okay, am I comfortable with this? Am I ready for this? And if so, what do I want it to be? And so I'm kind of letting it flow. I'm letting it come to me. I've, I've been receiving so much positive feedback and people really enjoying hearing my perspective, my brother's perspectives and just getting to know who we are as individuals. And I think, you know, a lot goes back to my mom and my dad. They wanted to make sure that if we wanted to be in the spotlight, we wanted to be in the media, in the forefront, it was our decision. And so once the doc came out, there was going to be no denying or avoiding, you know, the media and the attention that came with it. So instead of running mm -hmm. from it, I decided, you know what, I'm going to embrace it, allow it to come to me in an organic way, and then share my stories. And if people relate and want to hear more, then great. I'm I'm here. I'm an open book. I have no problem having those conversations. But it was definitely something that just happened naturally. I've been enjoying it thus far. And I'm grateful for mm -hmm. the people that want to hear more and connect and feel relatable to me in some kind of way. Mm -hmm. I love that. So tell me, tell me one of your fondest memories. Well, let me tell you one of mine first. I remember your mom telling me about a time when you were a little girl and you wore <laughs> her fur coat to school. <laughs> 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 and one of, and one of the teachers wound up calling her and mm -hmm. telling her that she wore because did you leave it at school? I did. We had a project and <laughs> I stole I, I borrowed one of her fur jackets um because she, like the friends that I was doing the project with they had to be a bear. So mm -hmm. I thought, okay, let me just borrow one of my mother's furs and bring it to school. However, when you borrow things without asking, you should return it in a secret manner. I totally left it at school and forgot until that teacher called my mother and said, yeah, your daughter left one of your furs here. And yeah, it was not pretty. <laughs> that's so, I think that's so funny and cute. And when your mom told me it was so endearing, she actually laughed about it and, uh, and thought it was really cool. So that being said, tell me one of your fondest memories of your mother. One you of know, your fondest memories with her. You being a mother now, I'm just wondering, what's one of your fondest memories of your mom? No, I, there's so many to choose from. My mother is my best friend, rock, and everything. Like, I don't do anything in life unless I can find my mom and have the conversation with her first. Um, mm -hmm. So to choose one memory is, is a disservice because I, there's so many that I can't. But I think one of the biggest moments were um, we went on a family trip. It was actually a birthday trip for Tracy to Greece. And mm -hmm. it was with her tribe. It was her. It was Sharice. It was, you know, Tashan. It was a whole squad. And it was my mom. Black my girl mom. magic. Yes, the old lady gang. But they're not old. They're far from old. But it was a trip to Greece. And I was just graduating. And I joined just to join. And it was one of the first times I got to really see my mom in just her element. Like, mm -hmm. yes, she's my mother. But she's also my friend. And I got to see her hang out with the people that she loved and endeared and brought into her circle. And how she was able to really pick her friends and make them family. And, and to yeah. understand that process to get to that tribe level and to have that squad be that squad and it was honestly incredible to witness and it's something that I appreciate because when I look at my girl group and my girlfriends I'm like dang I gotta get on that level like they've been yeah. riding die from the beginning for so long yeah. so that was probably yeah. something that really stuck out to me because my mother makes sure to keep her circle very very small for obvious reasons so to be able to That's witness cool. the true friendship she's been able to develop was something that I, I truly have cherished that's awesome. I remember. <laughs> that's actually true. And I, I, I remember her. Um, I remember when you turned 14, speaking of <laughs> keeping her circle tight. I remember when you turned 14 years old. I mean, when you were 14 and you were turning, you were planning. I came over to do your hair and you, I don't know if you remember this. You started planning, just watching the last dance. I was just thinking of things about you that remind me of the genius of your father and the genius I know of your mother. And I remember you being 14 years old and <clears throat> planning your, 
I remember you were making invitations one time and I said, Jazz, what are you doing? And you said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm planning for my sweet 16. Mm -hmm. And I said, your sweet 16? Well, that's <laughs> two years away. And you, said, <laughs> and you said, well, you have to plan ahead. And yeah. um, uh, how amazing was that event? So my question to you is, how far in advance do you plan for things that you're doing? How do you come up with your strategy mm -hmm. to I do think different things? I love plan. I love, like, I'm obsessed with it. You definitely want to plan ahead because you just never know what's going to happen. So you plan for the unexpected and the expected. Um, but I've, I've noticed as I've gotten older that, that when you plan things out to a T, then you limit yourself from other things taking place. And you sometimes block yourself from your own blessings. So okay. I like to plan and be strategic with my moves, but I also like to just take in my surroundings and take in my environment and events that are happening around me in an organic fashion. So that way, you know, I'm not robotic, you know, I'm human. Mm -hmm. I got I to gotta feel it all out and understand that some things are really out of my control and that's something that I have to accept. And if I accept it, then okay, whatever happens, happens. So I definitely do like to plan out as much as I can, but I also accept the fact that life is gonna be unexpected. It's a roller coaster and you just have to go with the flow and appreciate, you know, the good and the bad. I love that. I love that. And how, how, how old would you say you were, Jazz, when you realized that your dad is the most famous of the famous? in the world uh, it probably wasn't really until like i was 10 11 and, and i had to just google him and just be like okay what what am i gonna find if i type in michael jordan like i had no idea really other than yeah i go to games i go to the arena like those things felt normal to me and i'm my mind i'm thinking every child does this you know every kid is exposed to this portion of life and then once i started realizing and understanding and having the conversations with my mom and with my dad like no no, no we're very privileged, we're fortunate, we're blessed, you know, these are things that you have to appreciate and be grateful for. Then I started to understand, but that was following after I Googled and did a lot of research to really feel out, okay, this is my father. So people, when you were growing up, never said to you, uh, oh, that's, you never heard whispers of, oh, that's Michael Jordan's child, or they're their children, or there's, there's his wife. And did you ever, did, did any of that affect you? as you were growing yeah. up or were you pretty sheltered from that? But it never really registered. I'm just thinking, okay, you guys are just talking about my mom. You're talking about my dad. And I didn't think anything of it because my thing is people are always going to talk. You know, that's essentially yeah. something I can't avoid. So whether you're talking about right. me, Joe Blow down the street, you know, it is what it is. But for me yeah. at that young day, hey, if you're talking, you're talking. That doesn't mean I have to listen. <laughs> that's awesome. And so that's, that's interesting, the innocence of youth that speaks to that. So, you know, when you were coming up, some of your friends like E.J. Johnson and some of your other friends who I, I, I you know, I don't know all their names, had also had famous parents and stuff like that. So you were pretty low key on social media. Um, and I wonder, I wonder when you, did you ever desire to tell people, hey, look, I'm Michael Jordan's daughter. Y'all need to like put some respect on it. If I'm calling you because I want something, I'm Michael Jordan's daughter. Did you ever want preferential treatment at all? No, I really didn't because my thing no, you was, you know, if you go to my page, it says my bio, everything like that. But it, it also clearly states I am the daughter of Michael Jordan. So my thing is, I'm putting it out there just so we can address the elephant in the room. I'm not going to keep yeah. having it over me or hang over somebody else. And they want to dance around it and figure out, okay, can I ask? Like, no, I'm just going to put it out here, put it in the forefront. There it is. Like, mm -hmm. now you know what comes next. Like, it was never something I felt like I needed to constantly throw into people's faces or introduce myself as MJ's daughter. Mm -hmm. No, you're Jasmine. I'm going to introduce myself as Jasmine. And then how you take it from there is how you take it from there. But no, I never felt the need to really just be in the public eye like that. And if it happened organically, it just did. And that's essentially what's happening now. So Jazz, what, so then what kind of adversities did you have to overcome then? Being Jordan, growing up Jordan. I know you have brothers, but you're, you're, the, you're the girl and you're a black girl. So yeah. how, how did you, how, what kind of adversities did you face? Because I'm sure you were one of one of one in, in many of, of, of the groups you were in and, and growing up in environment wise. How, yeah. how, what kind of adversities did you face? It, it was definitely hard. With the name comes incredible responsibility and, and expectations and a sense of entitlement. So I always had to deal with, 
you know, people's perceptions of me, perceptions of me and trying to figure out, you know, what can they get from me and what they can't. Can I trust you or can I not? So that's something that I, it was frustrating because in my mind, you know, my mother, and my father raised, hey, be nice to everybody, but everybody's not your friend. And that was a concept mm -hmm. I really struggled with understanding. Because to me, I'm like, if I'm nice to you, then you're nice back. We can be friends. Like, there shouldn't be an issue. But then mm -hmm. you throw in the last name. Then you throw in that Jordan aspect. And it's like, okay, now that's the part of the world that I can't always decipher between. There's no avoiding. There's no changing. So if you're going to dot line and come to me because of that factor, then I got to weed you out. I have to keep you at bay. So mm -hmm. it was definitely frustrating and tiresome and, and, and annoying because to me, I'm a people's person. I'm, I'm a very, I'm an extrovert. I love interacting with people and just being friends and being social, so on and so forth. But that constant voice in your mind or constant reminder of that you can't trust everybody is constantly weighing on you in mm -hmm. someone in my and that's something you can't avoid. So it's definitely something that's tiresome. And I had to trust my gut a lot when meeting people or putting myself out there and letting it happen naturally. And then if I couldn't feel it, I had to pray about it and just let it be in God's mm -hmm. hand. At the end of the day, mm -hmm. if you were in my life, you're going to be in my life. And if you're not, then you've been removed for a reason. And I've heard you say in other interviews that you've always followed your gut and, mm -hmm. and prayed about things that you that you weren't that you weren't certain of, which I think is a great way of being. I do the same thing. And that's pretty much the secret in life to follow our gut mm -hmm. and to pray and be silent. Like now the world is having to atone. We're having to be still, if you will, mm -hmm. and uh, listen to our own voice, you know, listen to the yeah. voice of God, listen to our own voice. So <clears throat> do you feel a sense of obligation to uphold your father's legacy? No. Absolutely not. He has always made sure that, you know, myself and my brothers understand that the path that he laid isn't a path that's destined and determined and forced upon us. If we want to walk in those footsteps, we are more than welcome to. If we want to play basketball, by all means, go ahead. You want to go to UNC, go ahead. You want to work at Jordan Brand, go ahead. But it was never something that felt like an obligation or was forced upon us. And if anything, he really wanted us to deter from it. You know, he really wanted us to really become ourselves. And understand that the more that we learned about ourselves and evolved as individuals, the sooner and the better it's going to feel when we can walk into the room and just say, hi, I'm Jasmine and leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Or hi, I'm Jeffrey I and hi, I'm Marcus. You know, like that's, that's the blessing in disguise and the power within our own name and not the power within his name. So it's yeah. definitely that he never felt the need to force upon us. And if it was meant to be, it was meant to be and it would happen. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. I think that's great because you have so many kids who, whose parents have had have legacies and in the mm -hmm. second generation they feel like they have to you know live up to whatever the parents legacy is and sometimes children want to do their own thing they don't want to be you know in your case a basketball player I remember when you were younger and you played basketball but then I also remember you taking voice lessons and you know dance and acting and sing, you know all these different other things you did and wind up you wound up dancing and beginning to find your own voice which I love you know, I want to talk, Jasmine, a little bit now about Last Dance. I remember watching it in 1993 when your father retired from basketball the first time. <clears throat> I remember him retiring and going to play baseball, which is something he wasn't, which was a childhood dream of his, right? And he wasn't all that great at it, but his work ethic was so <laughs> strong that he would work before a game, play the game, and then after the game. Tell me about your work ethic and in your life today, some of the things that you really have to work hard at. Everything. I don't think there's anything in life to be with. Are you there? Yeah, I'm still here. So I think work ethic is something that it was instilled in me. Mm -hmm. I was born with it. I was born with my father's ability to really be determined and committed to something and there's no avoiding it. So for me, I always worked hard. Like, I joke about it. My mm -hmm. first job was at 15 at Forever 21 as a sales associate. You remember those days. I, I yes. literally went yes. to the hall to go to my job. <laughs> I do remember. I, I loved do. it. I, I knew that no matter what, I had to start working at some point. And if that was the case, then I'm going to do it on my own terms. I'm going to get my first job. I'm going to get my feet wet. I'm going to, you know, understand what it's like to actually hold my own and make my own money and not rely on anything that was created before me. Like, mm -hmm. no matter what. So work ethic is definitely something that's been instilled in me. And those that have been fortunate enough to work with me and to work alongside with me wouldn't disagree with me at all. 
And that's what I love about you. You always have had a strong work ethic. Look at the, listen to this, people. This is Michael Jordan's daughter at 15 working at Forever 21. <laughs> so it was really about her parents instilling in her, in, in them, their children, yeah. to have a strong work ethic, ethic. And you do. I remember. Did you graduate college in three years? I'm correct, right? I did, yeah. I graduated from You therapy. graduated. <laughs> I don't think people know that you graduated from Syracuse in three <laughs> years, in three yeah. years. And that takes a determination that I, you know, and drive and ethic, work ethic that I, you know, I feel is unmatched like your father's, you know, and yeah. your mom, your mom has worked very hard. I've watched her with things she's done in her life and she's worked very, very hard. So, so with that, with that being said, and you already talked about your first job, I would say that your dad's highly competitive. Are you pretty competitive? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like to lose. Like, mm -mm. I, I'm definitely very competitive and, and it comes out in different ways and various forms. So that competition is definitely in my bloodline and there's, there's no denying it when it comes out. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. Your dad was going to win at any cost. That's something I noticed watching the show as well. At absolutely. any cost. And, and sometimes Ralph's in, in, in enmity you know, jealousy and others, and, and it didn't matter. He pushed them to be great, which I think is a very good quality. Um, do you feel like at work and you have to push others around you? Mm -hmm. you know, do you feel like you have to bring people to your level when you're working sometimes? Yeah, sometimes I think no matter what, you want to motivate those that you're around, and you want to definitely make sure everyone's on the same page if you're going to commit to something. So I'm, I'm grateful for my sports marketing teammates and and leaders and everyone that, you know, I work with and strive with and connect with at Jordan brand, because we have an incredible team, you know, and if mm -hmm. I'm going to something, I'm going to expect to commit to it too. And I'm grateful that they are. So they definitely are all on the same level of understanding like, Hey, when we're doing a project or we're interacting with athletes, when we're representing them and, you know, hosting events, so on and so forth, we're representing a brand that's beyond and bigger than all of us, you know, myself mm -hmm. included. I definitely like to make sure that, those that I work with alongside of me are doing everything that I'm doing and are getting in the trenches if we have to get in the trenches. And what are some of the sacrifices you find yourself making today to keep winning? You know, I think the sacrifices I make is just, it's ongoing. I, I have to sacrifice, you know, my desires of wanting to please everybody. Like that's something that mm. I always want. I want people to be happy. I want people to be satisfied, but I got to understand I can't please everybody. I cannot make yeah. every single person happy. And even that eats away at me. Like, I'm, like I said, I'm not a people pleaser, but I love knowing that I can bring a smile or a joy to people's faces or, or I can bring a project and know that it fits this athlete to a T. But there's going to be mistakes. There's going to be moments where I can't fulfill the destiny and need and desires that somebody needs when I felt like I could have. And that sacrifice of understanding that everyone's not going to be happy with me or everyone's not going to love what I do or love what I have to say, so on and so forth, is something that is frustrating and I still have to accept at 27. But, you know, it, it, it is what it is and it comes with it. Like, I, if the job has to get done, a job has to get done. And if that means that I have to sacrifice, you know, all 15 people being happy and understanding that it's really only 14 or 12 or 11, that's something I have to just deal with. But it, it'll definitely eat away at me because I want everyone to be happy with whatever I do. And if my name is is on it. I want to make sure that everyone is enjoying it in the way that I designed them to. I love that. And do you feel like you have guilt sometimes? Like, do you feel guilty? I know for me, I struggle sometimes uh, being in the position I'm in in life. I feel like sometimes when I go out with friends or stuff, I feel like I have to be, you know, sometimes, well, I shouldn't say friends, but acquaintances, different things. I feel like I should be the one to pay for something or I feel guilty about where I am. Do you struggle with that at all? Not really. Um, I'm no. just like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to keep my circle tight. And if you're in my circle, we're all on the same level. So if, if we're going out and having a function, whatever it is, I got to have it. it. And if we go out another night and it's not on me, it's on the Courtney's and the Shanties and the Chastity's. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm fine. Then no, it's something that I feel an obligation to take care of those around me because I know naturally I'm going to always look out for those that are around me. And then they're going to do the same and for they're me. They're going to so, look out for you. That's I, right. Uh, that's just how we are. That's our friendship. That's our bond. That's our sisterhood or just how I am with family. So no, never that's any wonderful. guilt. That's wonderful to hear.
these things down because I was so enamored and my, my, my mind just was all over the place. I was just so filled. Um, again, being in your house, I keep reminding people, I was in your house three, four times a week. Your yeah. dad was there sometimes. And I'm like, hey, MJ, and not even knowing who I'm speaking to. You know <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> not even knowing the level of greatness. Again, I was trying to get to your mother's closet. So you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Whatever. So I mean, I, I, <laughs> you know this. I had no idea who I'm, you know, speaking to. Uh, but uh, it, it's funny. I noticed in the last dance that when your dad returned to basketball in '95, his first game was against the Indiana Pacers, whom mm -hmm. your fiance in recent years played for. Now mm -hmm. I found I found that quite ironic. You said in previous interviews that you and Raheem met at Syracuse and became good friends. Was there always an underlying attraction? And how did you and him start dating? Oh, there was definitely an attraction. He's always been cute. <laughs> yes, funny. yes. Um, but he was my first friend when I got to Syracuse, and mm -hmm. that's essentially just how we met and how we built upon and cultivated the relationship that we have today. And so I, I just loved his personality and who he was during Syracuse and being in college we just never thought like oh let's take that step so it wasn't until his rookie season um with the Indiana Pacers like you said where we were like okay we're single you're single I'm single let's see if this can evolve and become something and and that's essentially how we just started like I, I went down and visited him during um his assignment with the G League team in Fort Wayne and we've been together ever since so mm -hmm. it was definitely something and I, I couldn't have imagined. I think my friends even laugh today still at us being together for over four years that, like, you guys are together because no one really saw it happening. But, mm -hmm. I mean, right in front of me, and I missed it. And when I finally came to, and I realized that now I'm reaping the benefits of it. So I can't complain. <laughs> yeah, and I, I love that. I love that. And I remember coming to visit you at Syracuse. <laughs> I, love, I mean, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> so, so, so now you're following in mom's footsteps. What's it like dating a ball player? for girls who would like to date a ball player. Is it any different than dating any other guy? No, it is not different. The only difference is maybe, you know, our typical evenings are at games or things like that. Like, obviously now Rakeem is professionally playing overseas, so mm -hmm. that's different. I get to go to different countries and things like that. He just finished. His last team was in New, um, Puerto Rico. Before that, he was in New Zealand. He's been in China. He's been in Turkey. So, yeah, I get exposed to all of that joy, but you know, we still got our ups and downs and roller coasters like anybody else. So Jersey yeah. chasing ain't gonna nothing. It's not gonna solve your problems. Like you're human. We're human. At the end of the day, he's mm -hmm. a man. I'm a woman. We're a female, male, and whatever. So, you know, the love that's there is what matters most. But that jersey doesn't change and, anything. So now that you add motherhood to the equation, <laughs> is it easier or more difficult? It's shockingly easier. Um, and I think. I think it's just because of the fact that we we knew we were ready to take that step like it, it was uh -huh. happened and it wasn't an accident or anything like that like when i thought yeah. that, both elated and just excited so now my son no won. i remember you saying earlier in life if, if i can just interject i don't mean to cut you off but i'm gonna interject because i've been around i remember you said i'm gonna this is what she said guys i'm gonna graduate college i'm gonna find my husband i'm gonna marry him have my kids and you know work she said this, and she is living proof. I'm telling you, and yeah, just you because gotta, her name is, gotta what, put what it you out. say? You gotta put it out. You gotta put out what you want into the atmosphere and into the universe, and it comes back to you in tenfold. So no, that's mm -hmm. that's definitely something I know I spoke up. So knowing that, knowing that there's a lot to, and being a mother now of, on your own, dating a basketball player, you know, um, there's this being Jordan. What do you respect most about what your mom had to endure? Raising three kids, being married to the most famous man in the world. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely give so much credit to my mama. Her strength is something that's out of this world because to deal with, like you said, the, the attention and the media and everything that came with my father and his career and still raising the three of us and keeping us as humble and grounded as we are, that's in incredible. Incredible. That's a feat within it itself. Is. So it is. it's something I definitely appreciate. I mean, she made sure that no matter what, it didn't matter if we lived in Highland Park, in the mansions or whatever, like we still knew that we were regular individuals and just 
blessed and privileged. We made sure we went to see the cities and, and areas in Chicago. We saw our family in the South Side on the Wild Hunt. It's like, we knew what yeah. we came from, we were blessed with, but we also needed to understand that it's a blessing and it can be taken away from you at any point in time. So don't take it for granted. And that is something that mm -hmm. my mother really did instill into the three of us. And without that, I think we would truly be different individuals. If we weren't raised to be grounded and humble and appreciative, I don't think we would be who we are today. And the majority of that goes back to my mother, if not all of it. Yeah, I agree. And your mother herself, you know, not to make this about her, but she was just so grounded. I remember walking, being downtown at different times, and it was just really inspirational for me to see Juanita Jordan walking down Michigan Avenue, which I now know was to her office from where mm -hmm. you all lived in the city, from the condo you all had. So let me ask you this. Do you want more children? You know, I think Kimi is enough You talked about more. Oh, no, 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 sister. Don't change it now. You told me how many you wanted. Don't change it because right Dan knows me. <laughs> huh? He's enough right now? And to be. Changed you then, saying that how has motherhood changed you? It's, I mean, motherhood is just a constant reminder that you have somebody else to put before you. You can't be selfish. You have to make sure that this living individual, this breathing blessing is good 24-7, 365, no matter what. And that's something that, you know, no one could teach you. You can't be, you can't be taught how to be a mother. You can take from the women and the mother figures in your life and cultivate who you want to be. But until you actually have that child in front of you and begin instilling and making those rules and guidelines and knowing that that individual is fully dependent on you, it's all stories, it's all talk, and you just don't know until you're in that moment. And that's something mm -hmm. I, I respect, and you really can't describe it until you really become a mom. Like, and that's something my mother used to always say, like, oh, wait till you have kids. You'll understand when you have a, a child. I get it. <laughs> I you get, get it now, huh? <laughs> and the sacrifices and everything that, that comes along with it, and I'm, I love every sacrifice that I make for him. I, I would give that baby whatever he needed, my arm, my body, my heart, my soul, like whatever he needs, he's got it. And I'm gonna make sure that he's always covered. And that's something that you just have to feel and know and love. I love that. And you're the first, you're the first, your, your baby, which happens to be a boy, is the first of the generation, of that generation born, of the third generation Jordan born, correct? Yep, yeah, he is, so. That's amazing. So you were the last? That daughter of the three children and now you have the first grandchild that's amazing so so yes. jasmine what legacy are you creating of your own within the jordan brand today you know i think i'm i'm grateful to be a part of the jordan brand from a career standpoint in sports marketing and helping evolve the women's division in the department that we have you know we just finished we're not finished. We just um, launched our apparel and footline about a little over a year and a half ago with Jordan Women's. And it's something that has really been unprecedented. We, we've been talking about having a women's line and, and having women's product, but it was all about timing and making sure the timing was right for it. And now timing's of the essence and it's perfect. So to be a part of that journey to actually see the brand that is really started from the man himself and on the hardwood and all of his accomplishments begin to evolve into streetwear and lifestyle and seating mm -hmm. for women to the generations that haven't even seen him play is something that I've been privileged and grateful to be a part of. So mm -hmm. I'm definitely enjoying just evolving that brand and making sure that we're hearing our, you know, our female consumers and our female audience and servicing them in the proper manner and making sure we have the right team to back that up in our women's division. And mm -hmm. it's a legacy that, you know, really started itself but it's a legacy that I'm going to carry on and push forward because now is the perfect time more than ever to really see our women's brand build and flourish. Awesome. That's awesome. Okay, last question, Jazz. Jasmine, I'm sorry. I call you Jazzy. <laughs> <laughs> last question. Y'all better not call her that if you see her. <laughs> last question. <laughs> you seem to... I have to reserve something for myself, Jazz. I have to reserve oh, something. Oh, you get Jazzy. Everybody else has to call me Jazz or Jasmine. That's it. <laughs> Y'all hear that, right? All right. So, Jasmine, last question. You seem to be following in your mom's footsteps in ter with, with Hakeem in terms of philanthropy. Um, I remember in 2005 when, when your mom and dad pledged $5 million. I don't know if people really know this. They pledged $5 million to help 
an all black boys school called Hell's Franciscan on the south side of Chicago. I know that you're doing uh, you're, you're being you're doing philanthropic things with um, your husband to be organization and found foundation, I should say. How important is giving to you? It's very important because like I said, I, I come from a privileged and blessed family and it's something that I'm not going to deny, hide or run away from, you know? My thing is when it comes to my philanthropic profile and understanding that giving back is, it has to be on terms that I'm comfortable with and not in expectations. Like, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people sometimes feel like as celebrities or people with wealth, people with money, we owe people that need help. Like we have to help those in doubt. When truth be told, nobody does. Celebrities don't have to, athletes, nobody is entitled to my father's done today. Those are genuine acts of, of kindness and in and philanthropy. And those are decisions that have lied within them and they're wanting to do. So for me, I never wanted to build a philanthropic profile until I knew I was truly comfortable and ready and aligning with anything that spoke to my heart and, and something mm -hmm. that really represented me. So with working with my fiance and, and his foundation, Rakeem Christmas Foundation, it's about giving back and building a safe haven uh, community back home in St. Croix, where he's from. And that's something mm -hmm. that spoke to me because I know how much St. Croix and the Virgin Islands mean to him. And the first trip I went down there, I mean, they welcomed me with open arms in a manner that I, I couldn't even describe. Like it was home and, and family and love from two seconds of being on that island. I have never been there, you know? So mm -hmm. for me, I definitely am going to continue to build on my profile and giving back and, and helping those that I feel are in need, but it has to come from the heart. It has to be genuine. It has to be something that's real versus just doing it because I have the ability to do it. I'm, I'm never going to give back in that manner. I'm going to always give back in a way that speaks to my core values and my morals and who I am as an individual and knowing that, okay, this dollar is going to go far versus this dollar is a dollar and you're going to just take it. I love that. Jasmine, I am so proud of you. I am. Uh, I get emotional. I'm not going to cry, but no, I, I love you I so really much. Better not. <laughs> you already know me, Jazz. You already know me, but I love you. I'm looking forward to the wedding. So, okay, I know I said that was the last question, but one more question. You didn't even <laughs> let me see your dresses. I'm letting you know that, Missy. I want no, to see your dresses. No, no, <laughs> you trying to surprise me? I'll I've say seen the prom I've dresses. I've seen, no, what? I get, exactly. I have to be surprised. <laughs> they just it's all good. It, so I have to see them myself. <laughs> oh, you haven't seen them yet? I haven't seen them since the design and the sketches. So I, I'm excited to see them in person soon. Hoping I can do oh that. Oh god. I'm so excited about that. Whenever it's gonna be. Hopefully it will be when it's supposed to be. But even I if it isn't, whenever it is, it's going to be quite an event. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of the woman you are and have become and are continuing to evolve into. I will always follow you. I love you so much. And I hope to get there to see you soon. Absolutely. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for tuning in, those who have. And mm. um, we gonna do what we do. I love you yeah. guys. Thank you everybody. <laughs>